Welcome back to the Mini Kime Show featuring Lenny, the only NFL podcast. One of the hosts thinks an outside release should happen three times a day at minimum. That's Lenny. He'd be he'd be up for like five walks a day, honestly, if he had his way. Uh, I'm Mini Kimes, and I am joined today for the first time in a minute by the host of the Athletic Football Show, uh, Robert Mays. Welcome to the show. Mina, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I was joking with you a little bit earlier about the Brandon Ayuk ongoing trade saga. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason I bring that up is we are previewing the AFC North today. Sorry, I should have said that at the top. And last week I did the NFC West with Jackson Bevins, which if you guys haven't listened, check it out. Uh, it was a ton of fun. We put the Niners last on the off chance that an IU trade <laughs> happened while we were recording. For that exact same reason, we are going to do the Steelers last today because Brandon Ayuk has been holding my podcast hostage now for two straight weeks. I don't know how to handle this because part of me <laughs> is sympathetic to Brandon Ayuk because if I was presented with this situation where there was one team that was willing to give me $30 million, but it was not as good as my current situation where another team was willing to give me like $27 million, I have no idea what I would do. Well, and that seems to be his problem. He has no idea what he wants to do. We were joking about this and, and over text, but it really is like when you're in a relationship with someone who is incredibly hot, I'll just say what I said in the text, but maybe doesn't value you the way they should. That's the San Francisco 49ers. And you're like, should I leave this person? I know I can't do better than them, but this other person, sorry, Steelers, you're the less hot person in this analogy, wants to value me more. And I think similarly to that, when you are the friend who is on the outside of that, listening to that person whine about it for weeks and weeks, at a certain point, you're just like, I, you don't know what you want and I don't want to hear about it anymore. And that is how I feel about Brandon Ayuk. My wife has this thing, wherever she doesn't want to talk to somebody, her, her move is always like, damn, that's crazy. Like that, That's kind of how I feel with everything that's happening with the Brandon Ayuk <laughs> thing. Like she's coming in, it's like, damn, that's crazy. And then I just want to move on. I don't want to be a part of it anymore. Just let me know when you get it figured out and I'll have a reaction when we get there. It's frustrating too, because he is such an impactful player that it completely changes the tenor of the conversation about both of these teams. So I think when we get to the Steelers, if he hasn't been traded, we'll talk about what it would be like if he was there and what it would be like if he's not a little bit, um, because it does make such a difference. Uh, we're not going to start with the Steelers though, like I said. Uh, I want to start with the Ravens, the division champs. Uh, I've been really excited to have this particular conversation with you. Um, I want to start on the offense. Uh, so I have, I did... A top 10 offenses pod, the only top 10 offenses pod done by anyone on any podcast anywhere. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I, the sense I've gotten from sort of uh, tasting the smattering of options out there is that I am higher on the, the, the Ravens offense than most people. I think I had them, it was definitely top five. I can't remember if I had them fourth or fifth or whatnot, but I, I was very high on them. My argument, Robert, was um, you build on what you did last year. It was year one with Todd Munkin. I think we saw a lot of what we hoped we would see in year one from both him and Lamar with the evolution of the passing game, the integration of the run game and the pass game. Uh, yes, you're losing a lot of starting offensive linemen, which I think is holding a lot of folks back. But you get back healthy Mark Andrews uh, for the season. I think you get you know yet another year from Isaiah Likely, who I'm really excited about. Derek Henry, oh, by the way, is also in the mix. I, either talk me down or tell me if you agree with me about because I my sense right now is I'm a little bit higher than consensus. I think there are two contribute two kind of pull, push and pull factors here. One is the offensive line potentially pulling things down. And the selling point from them is that they're getting a little bit younger, you know, maybe guys who fit what they want to do offensively more than the previous regime, considering Morgan Moses was somebody they traded for before Todd Monken was going to get there. But in the other side of this, you have year two of the system. And when I was there, I think talking to Todd Monken about some of the things that they were considering what he was really wanted to get across was we can pare this thing down to just the stuff that we're good at now. And that's a particularly interesting realization for them because they had to sort through so many different iterations of the offense. This is a team that didn't use three receiver sets more than like 15 or 20% of the time under the previous regime. Now it's 50% of the time. And I think you combine that with, well, what do we do with Ricard? Like he's this unique piece. So how do we sort through that? We have these 12 personnel looks that we like. How do we best use those guys? And you could see that over the first half of the season. It was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of experimentation. And I think they came out 
over the course of the second half of the year, and they really got an understanding of who they wanted to be and how they wanted to use their guys. And if they can continue to build on that, there's a chance that they can get over some of these offensive line concerns and they matter a little bit less. So you mentioned the three wide receiver sets and Ricard, and I want to talk a little bit about the different personnel groupings that they trot out. The problem with trying to uh, group the Ravens offense by personnel groupings is none of them accurately represent what's happening on the field. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, like, cause Isaiah likely is like kind of like a receiver. Patrick yeah. Ricard is basically a tight end. So when you're going 11, 21, 12, it all means different things and, and whatnot. However, um, when they are in, uh, were in 11 personnel last year, which as you said, they used a lot, way significantly more obviously um, with the addition of Zay Flowers in particular in this offense. Um, one thing that r sort of surprised me is, and this was a continuation of when they used it in much smaller dosages in the prior years, they barely ran the football. I think there was this vision of a Ravens offense with Flowers and Munkin and this better passing game that would spread things out a little bit more with come out with three wide receivers, which they did, and then benefit from that with their unbelievable rushing attack. But they just didn't. In fact, they had the highest pass rate out of those looks in the NFL. Do you think that there's meat on the bone there, whether we're talking about Derrick Henry or Lamar Jackson carrying the football? Yes, and, and I think the way that they're conceiving of Derrick Henry and how they think that this could be a little bit different even later in his career, Derrick Henry has run into heavy boxes on 48% of his yeah. rushes over the last three years. And if that's about, excuse me, uh, he's into, run into light boxes on 24% of his rushes over the last three years. The league average is 48%. He was not look, running into any favorable looks when he was in Tennessee, and that offensive line was bad. The Ravens, it, they were sixth in the NFL in yards before contact for on running back carries last year. If they can get him into some more favorable looks, get him on the edge, have him running against some white boxes, it's just a different version of Derrick Henry than we've ever seen, and I think that's where they see some real potential with him. The question becomes, if you walk out 11 personnel or 20 personnel with Ricard, whatever, three receivers, and you get... <laughs> favorable run looks are you in a place where you can consistently check into the right stuff and when you go into year two of a system there's more confidence in getting into premium plays that was something that was communicated to me when i was there and that's why i think that that optionality out of those looks with henry just gives them a different dimension than they had last year and i do think that they're cognizant of that uh, you mentioned derrick henry in particular who goes from even with the offensive line changes a dramatic upgrade in circumstances <laughs> from what he was dealing with, which you, you laid out there in Tennessee. Who, how, who would you, by the way, I just sidebar, who would you say is getting the better upgrade, him or Saquon? It's tricky, right? It's to me, it's probably Saquon. Yeah. Just because the Titans were bad last year and the Titans were really bad last year. The Titans had the second worst offensive line in the league going back and watching the 2023 it's giants. It, it, it's yeah. almost not even useful time. Yeah. Because you can't make any determinations about what the rest of their pieces are because right. their offensive line was not a functional NFL offensive line. So it's it's hard to say, but I think it's probably Saquon. Yeah. Both members of the Mina Kimes dynasty team, by the way. Uh, we're, 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 we're rolling over here. Um, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I think you're probably right there. But I do think Henry is walking into, as, as you just said, a wonderful situation. Um, I have seen not concerns, but some questions uh, about what he'll look like in a rushing attack that primarily, almost exclusively opposite oper operates from the gun and the pistol. Um, so I was curious, because that's obviously different from Tennessee as well. Over the last three years, Derrick Henry, when he's not under center, and it's, it's not the, it, it is a decent sample size. He's got nearly 200 carries. Um, the yards per carry are fine, 4.9, but his rushing yards over expected per carry, which you must always look at when we're talking about Derrick Henry and this Titans offense, tied for third league-wide with CMC and Jonathan Taylor. He's going to be fine, Robert. I was shocked when I looked at those numbers because I was curious about the same thing. He's been better out of the gun, like significantly yeah. better out of the gun. The EPA per rush, the success rate, everything you could want looks really good. And Jonathan Taylor is another good example, somebody that – it walked into a situation in Indy over the last couple of years where it's a lot of 11 personnel. And even if you're a good, one of the best backs in the league, you're going to get a lot of favorable looks. And I do think that that is going to happen for Derrick Henry in Baltimore. And that's why I'm excited to see him in this offense and just see what it all looks like. So if I do have concerns about the offense, aside from the offensive line, um, it would be the receiving group. Just 
for a litany of reasons. Uh, it's not very deep, obviously. Um, and it's also that there's injuries there. There's been injuries. I think Rashad Bateman might be hurt yet again. I don't want to slander him if he's not hurt, but I feel like I just saw somewhere that he got hurt. Uh, still holding on to my tiny shreds of, of stock there. But um, you're looking at Flowers, Bateman, Aguilar, who I did just see right before he locked on, caught a beautiful deep ball from Lamar Jackson. So we'll see uh, how well, that Yesterday, I think out. he dropped two and Lamar threw his helmet. So as always, it's a mixed bag with Nelson Aguilar. Deontay Hardy is on this team. I didn't realize that until I looked at the depth chart. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, does that concern you? Now, I say that with the major caveat, and this kind of connects to what we said earlier, that this is a team, you know, that – uh, will roll out a 12 grouping with likely who has a very wide receivers like skill set. I think very probably more than they did last year with Andrews back in the mix, but that's still a pretty thin grip. Do you think that could be something that holds back this offense? Yeah. And I also don't know how the roles shake out because I think that Zay Flowers really showed you that he can run some big boy routes on the outside last year. And so my question is, if he's going to be like your true number one receiver in pretty traditional ways, which I think he can do despite his frame, what do you do with the other receiving roles? Because Rashad Bateman last year was like a vertical presence for them. He was yeah. running a lot of posts and vertical routes. And it's like, I don't really think that's what Rashad Bateman's game is. So is that something that Devontae Walker could do for you to kind of be a lid lifter, which is a Matt Harmon term that I really like? And what does that mean for kind of your underneath option? Does that mean it should be Isaiah Likely because he kind of fits that better than anybody else in your offense? So that's my biggest concern. I think that they probably have enough bodies to get there, but I do think that sorting out the roles is going to be the biggest question because we didn't really see a lot of Isaiah Likely and Mark Andrews together, together last year. Yeah. So when they're on the field together, how does that ultimately shake out? Like that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at. Yeah, I've mentioned this before, but the 12 personnel numbers from last year are absolutely insane for the ball. They're very, Rams. very good. They're and insane. and when they're in 21 with Ricard, like it when they throw the ball out of those looks, it's it's well, dynamic. The other thing I like about the the 12 from last year, and this is very, very Todd Munkin, it was about a clean 50-50 run pass rate. Whereas, you know, I, I alluded earlier to the fact that when they were in 11, it was very skewed throw. And then when they were in heavier looks, they went for a run. But that... That, to me, is where these Baltimore Ravens want to live. I mean, last year we saw, and this is why I was so optimistic about the offense, you saw, like, it wasn't just, like, glimpses of this, like, dominant play-action passing attack. It it happened, right? Like, last season, we already got, we saw it. Um, so the idea that you can build on that in year two with, hopefully, a healthy tight end group, I think is really enticing. I don't want to skim over the offensive line stuff, though, because I keep saying, like, if the offensive line is healthy, like, like, like what do you think? Like, like, I'm looking at it right now. So we saw a little bit of Roger Rose Garden, by the way, playing right tackle at a UW, who was a second round pick. Um, I've been trying to get a feel for the starting lineup. And I think that position is the most interesting because you have Daniel Falele, who I saw somewhere might play guard. I don't like, That's you know, he has been playing. Yeah. Very and okay. So McCarty, the problem with him yeah. is it's about yeah. how much you can play him. I mean, they, yeah. he can't really get through an entire training camp practice at this point because of the size that he is. And so I don't know how that ultimately shakes out. McCary has been good depth for them, but if he's not your starting right tackle, it's just a different complexion as a group. And the thing with fall that I find interesting, if he doesn't, if he can't play 60 snaps a game, this is a team that has rotated offensive linemen before. Yeah. So is this a situation where if he gives you 40 and you get something from Josh Jones, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some creative potential solutions because this group and this staff specifically has been willing to dip into some weird stuff when it comes to the offensive line. And I think that that puts more things on the table with this team. Follow, would he be the biggest guard in the history of the NFL if he played? I, Anthony, uh, <laughs> uh, not Anthony Davis, Leonard Davis, I think probably would give him a run for his money. Yeah. When Leonard Davis was with the Cardinals, I'm trying to figure I, out. You're the right person to ask this question. <laughs> I was just... Leonard Davis was 6'6, 360. So Fall Alley is 6'8, 380. That he probably would be. Yeah. I mean, he might be one of the biggest offensive linemen, period, let alone. Yeah, period. Guards. But Gar, yeah, that's wow. Um, all right. Well, reasonable concerns about depth. I, I maybe I'm. I don't know. I just feel like I, I, you know, I, I, last year I saw an offense that was ahead of schedule in my opinion. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty excited about, it. and I'm, and I don't want to brush over likely to, I'm really high on him. I think some of the stuff he flashed last year, route running with the ball in his hands, the explosive playability, how he compliments Andrews. And then they have Charlie Kohler as a blocker that he's, I think could be a really special player. So I'm it, it's super interesting. excited how these teams are conceiving of their 12 personnel, because if the way that the league has shifted, 
we're now getting nickel pers- nickel defense to 12 personnel 60th percent of the time. Right. So I think most teams conceive of it where like if we're going to if that's going to happen, we have to grind teams down. Like that's where our matchup advantages come. But with the Ravens, it might just be as simple as, you know what, these are our best receivers. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter that it's Isaiah likely on a slot corner. These are our best receiving options. And so I think they can consider their 12 personnel a little bit different than some of these other teams do where if they are getting nickel to it it's like ah, we don't care like Isaiah likely against your nickel is still potentially a matchup advantage for us in the way it might not be for a lot of other teams the reports out of Ravens camp I've been seeing are like Isaiah likely like locked in an iron sharpens iron matchup with Kyle Hamilton just inject it like you know that's all you want to sell me on Isaiah likely that's all I need um okay speaking of Kyle Hamilton the defense uh obviously either the best or second best in the NFL, depending on how you regard the other one in the division we're going to talk about. Uh, a lot of change, though. The spine of the defense remains basically the same. Keep I, You came out of week eight. I feel like it was slept on that they also kept Michael Pierce, who was freaking awesome for this team last year. Uh, it's a little duo, remains. too. The body types, the, those two together at the same time. It's like, I can get on board with this. And Travis Jones, I, I like quietly love. Um, Another ascending player. Yeah, Trenton Simpson steps into the Patrick Queen role. I'm, I know, uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna pretend like I have super strong opinions about him, but I am of the belief that you can probably put anyone next to Roquan Smith. Um, but everything sounds pretty good about him. I think that's uh, the then, bet they're making too. Yeah, right. Uh, Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams remain at safety. The biggest question, there's two. There's the edge rusher aspect of this, which we can get to, but I want to start at cornerback because. Um, Last week, or earlier this week, pardon me, we did like a small sample size thing talking about the preseason. Nate Wiggins, man, <laughs> who apparently is fine. How big is it for this defense? I'm, and I, you know, I, I, I joke that he's on pace for to average 30 pass breakups a game, but how big is it if he is a plus starter year one for this defense? It's amazing. I mean, because it gives you so much optionality at that spot. So when Kyle Hamilton pops down to the nickel, Is it Marlon Humphrey and Brandon Stevens? Is it Marlon Humphrey and Nate Wiggins? I don't know, but that's a great problem to have. If the fact that you might have too many starting caliber outside corners is like the only team in the NFL you could potentially say that about. I was looking at the back, the the secondary, and I was thinking like, what's the best, you know, like starting lineup here when they come out in nickel? And I was like, okay, so yeah, like Humphrey, I feel like at this point in his career, you wanted the, you know, want him in the slot a little bit more. And then I was like, wait, you know, like, why are you trying to figure this out? This is going to be a game to game thing, matchup yeah. thing. And that's an incredible, incredible situation for a first time defensive coordinator. There's no doubt. And I also think that we could see more dime looks from them this year than we did last year, because when they had that personnel with Queen and Roquan, you're best when you have five defensive backs on the field and two linebackers on the field. But Arthur Millette played decent football for them last year. And now he's somebody that's kind of been forced out of that group. So is there a situation where he can get on the field with Humphrey, yeah, with Stevens, with at Wiggins? a 100% pressure rate? <laughs> This is, again, it is a very, very good problem to have. And and I do think that everything that I heard when I was there about Zach Gore and just kind of how things feel different for Mike McDonald, they're, they're going to turn it up a little bit. And having more guys on the field capable of doing that, I think, is particularly intriguing. So I think that or in terms of stepping in for Mike McDonald, will not have a hard time figuring out things on the back end. I do think it's trickier on the front end. Yeah. Um, because... I don't think it can be overstated how awesome Jadavian Clowney was on this team last year. I, I feel like we kind of slept on it a little bit on this show on the NFL Live. Like I, I was thinking about that um, when I was uh, previewing the Panthers. Part of me thinking about like what he might bring to the table there at this point in his career. Like we talk so much about Mike McDonald and the simulated pressures, but like Clowney flat out balled out both as a pass rusher and against the run and in coverage. And I don't think losing him is a small thing. I'm going to read you the guys who had more pressures last season than Jadavian Clowney, according to PFF. Micah Parsons, Aiden Hutchinson, Nick Bosa, Max Crosby, Josh Hines Allen, Khalil Mack, TJ Watt, Miles Garrett, Daniel Hunter, Trey Hendrickson. That's it. It was 11th. This is somebody that was a really good run defender for long stretches of his career and was okay as a pass rusher. Somehow, a decade into playing in the NFL, he had the best year of his career as a pass rusher last season. And whether that's – and Mike McDonald got career years from half the people on that defense, right? I think that's what good units and good coaches do. But they brought in Chuck Smith last year, who's kind of a pass rush expert to be their outside linebackers coach. And I think that you could see some of the impact of that. Like, Clowney's bag got deeper 
10 years into his career last year with the Ravens. And I hope that's an indication that it can be a rising tide thing for all of the guys who step into that role. If you could do that with Clowney, can you do that with whoever you slot in there? But I do think that it's important to acknowledge just how good he was last year and the fact that they are going to miss him. So I feel like for this unit to be anywhere in close, anything where close to where they were last year in terms of the the pressure rate they got, um, you do need one of these young pass rushers to step up. Odafe Owe is really the first name that comes to mind. I mean, there's other, you know, they kept Kyle Van Noy. Uh, David Ojabo was injured again last year. He's coming off of that. You draft Adisa Isaac. But Owe, to me, is the clear and obvious name. They they picked up his fifth-year option, like, which was a pretty strong vote of confidence in a player who's been good but not great. And I'm a little conflicted on him, Robert, because um, the underlying numbers did not love him last year, just looking at – pressure rate, pass rush win, um, cer- even, you know, certainly sacks, but even pressures and hurries. But there were games where I he did pop to me on tape. You saw the athleticism and the smarts and the reasons why they drafted him where he was. Where do you stand on him as a player? Do you think he's capable of sort of carrying that mantle? I do. I, I think that he needs to add, again, a little bit more to his bag. He he really did make strides last year. I mean, on a per-rate basis, he was right behind, like, Aiden Hutchinson and Rashawn Gary. If you look at, like, pass rush productivity on PFF, I mean, he mm-hmm. wasn't on the field as much as those guys, but he was affecting the quarterback way more consistently last That's year true. than he had early in his career. The guy's 25 years old. He came into the league at, like, 16. So he's still got a lot of time to be able to kind of develop these things. So I'm not surprised that they picked up that option because he has shown real growth over the yeah. last couple of years, and they need him to take another step forward if this defense is going to be as good as they want it to be. Because if you can get what you got out of Kyle Van Noy last year, that's a miracle. And <laughs> everything else is a huge, huge question. So I, I said when we did our show about the FC North today that I thought that OA was like the most important kind of X factor piece on this entire team because of this pivotal player. I um I interviewed Cam Jordan, and that's going to be on my YouTube this week. And I asked him. He, he, by the way, watches like a lot of film and which was really cool because, yeah. you, know, you, you know, some guys just don't really watch around the league. That dude, he's like, watch, he's looking for, you know, he, he I think he had a joke about like how he has someone cut to get, cut him the best TFLs of the week. I'm like, you're a freaking sicko. Um, but anyways, I asked him for a young pass rusher whose game he really liked and he mentioned OA first. And I was, I was like, oh, that's, you know, not, 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 not what I expected. So notable, um, certainly. I do think, I agree, but I also think, you know, well, I was, this is the time of year or actually it would have been earlier when the Ravens do their obligatory, like training camp, random veteran off the street, but there's, they're all not, gone. Yeah. In Gakwe, I, but trust like, me. Uh, I live in Chicago, Illinois. I've been looking at the depth chart at the bears edge rushing depth chart. I, I've been yeah. very, very aware of which veteran free agent pass rushers are out there. And the well is dry this year. Clowney signed like three months before he typically does. So most of those guys are off the street for the Bears, Ravens, any other team that is edge needy right now. All right. Um, okay, so that's the Baltimore Ravens. Let's talk about the Bengals next. Um, this one, I'm actually, I re- I'm excited to have you on because I know you were there. And I want to start by talking about the offense and Joe Burrow. And I wanted to just get your sense uh, from watching him. You know, he did have one preseason drive uh, which was a little bit interesting, you know, I, I'll get to that in a second, but I want to know, I want to hear what you thought uh, from being in Cincinnati and just from talking to folks there about kind of where he is coming back from the injury, what you saw from him. They think health wise that he's very much on the right track early in camp. He was taking off every third day from throwing, but that was more precautionary than anything. They had already kind of worked him back into a normal schedule. There are certain periods where they'll take certain throws off the table for him if he's been throwing a little bit too much. Like on day three, do we maybe cut down on some of the deeper throws? Like they're conscious of stuff like that, but that's just overly precautionary. He looks as good as they want him to look right now. And in Cincinnati, the fact that the quarterback is practicing in August is a miracle. I mean, he hasn't had a normal training camp essentially since he came into the NFL. He had the calf last year. He had the appendix the year before. So the fact that he's able even to practice for them, they're in a very good mood over there compared to how the last few training camps have gone. Well, that brings me to my next question about Joe Burrow and I guess the Bengals generally, which is what do we think this offense is going to look like this year? Um, So I talked about this a little bit when I previewed 
my top 10 offenses with Steven Ruiz. But, you know, one of the more fascinating storylines, God, that's, it's, this is the way I'm about to end this sentence really belies the beginning of the sentence, which is one of the more fascinating storylines. The second half of the NFL season was the Bengals putting uh, Jake Browning under center and having a more efficient play action <laughs> passing attack. Someone put me out of my misery, please. That's it's so true, though. I mean, like, that's the type of sentence. weird nonsense that we have to be <laughs> preoccupied with, but it's true. Splits uh, under Browning. <laughs> 0.26 EPA for play, play action. Uh, Joe Burrow play action last year. Now, obviously, Joe Burrow, the offense last year, it was a mixed bag for a number of reasons, injuries. But extreme 0.1 EPA per play um, that goes from being below average to one of the best play action passing attacks in the NFL. Uh, and then a big difference was, of course, that uh, Burrow op- has operated almost exclusively from in the gun, including when they use play action, which they've never used at a high rate with him. Uh, Jake Browning, they put under center. And it looked great. So I mentioned the uh, first preseason drive. I did watch this with interest to see if they were going to tip their hand. (laughs) Don't laugh at me. Don't judge me. (laughs) It's definitely there. Everything they did on that preseason drive is exactly what they're going to do in week one. Uh, They did have one rep under center that immediately got blown up. So anyways, uh, I do think this is interesting, though, because uh, this is an offense that has gone in a pretty different direction from the rest of the NFL outside of teams like Buffalo and Philadelphia to a, obviously a very different degree, but you know, th- that's just not what they've done with Joe Burrow. Um, and I think you could argue, and you saw this on display, they have left certain concepts, explosives off the table because of it. It's impacted their run game as well. So that's, I know you talk to folks there about that and I, or not, I don't know about that, but, uh, the scheme. Oh, I absolutely whether... did. Okay, so yeah, dump. Let's go. Like, am I crazy for wondering if that's something we might see more of in 2024? Not at all. It, it was such a weird season for them last year because for the first four weeks of the year, he literally couldn't take a snap under center. So that was one of the reasons you didn't see more of it because he physically couldn't do it. You go to the Arizona game and you go to the San Francisco game and we get more of it in those games. That When I talk to people, I think that their ideal version of what the offense would look like where it's a mixture of the things that Joe likes, which we can talk about why he likes those things and why they're important and a mixture of some of the more under center play action stuff to kind of find those explosives. The San Francisco game is what they pointed to. And if you look at that game, they're using play action on like 21% of their drop back or 21% of their plays in that game. The Vikings led the league at 21% last year. So I, I think that's closer to what we might expect. And I would expect them to use more play action from the gun in order to meld those two worlds a little bit more. We've seen this with teams. The Dolphins have done some of this stuff. The Niners have done some of this stuff where you're trying to meld your gun gap scheme run game and play actions to try to find explosives in that world. I can I expect the Bengals to lean into that a little bit more because they know they can be efficient. It's about finding explosives as, te- as teams have transitioned to playing them a certain way. Do you think we'll see more of that? You just jogged something in me across the league as more defenses use disguise on the back end, just because they teams don't more quarterbacks don't want to turn their backs to the defense. Yes, I I do think that's a part of it. And with with Joe, it's like it's partially turning your back to the defense, but it's also the things he can get from the shotgun. So there are times where he'll he likes to be in the gun because he manipulates the back alignment in order to get information from the defense. Mm. So what he'll do is he'll just move people around in order to see how the linebackers move and he'll make checks based on that. So there are elements of the things he can do. And this has there been their repeat reprieve for the last like three years. It's like he's Peyton Manning. Like there's no reason for me to defang that when he has that sort of mental and cognitive ability. So it's about finding the right middle ground for us. It's not that he hates playing under center. It's just that there are certain benefits you lose if you stick him under center. And I think that's what they're trying to figure out. Hmm. Um, well, speaking of sort of, well, I, I like, we should talk about some of the changes in the rest of the team. Um, the offensive line. <sighs> I don't know what's the latest with Amarius Mims, by the way, who looked great in his first preseason outing, but is banged up. They were thrilled yeah. with, with how he had looked. Yeah. And it was just kind of an it was kind of a happy accident. I mean, Trent Brown missed a huge portion of the offseason program, and it just meant that Amarius Mims was getting all those reps, and he was just checking every box you could ask him to check along the way. And then this happens. 
again, though, this is adjacent to the point about the Ravens defensive backs. Like, they're in a good spot if Trent Brown is the guy that you have to put in there. Like they signed right. Trent Brown, assuming he would be their starting right tackle. And even if he missed a good chunk of time and there are some conditioning questions, he'll be ready by the start of the regular season. So in an ideal world, I think Mims just would have taken that job and run with it, and Trent Brown would have been depth. But I think they're going to be okay no matter how that shakes out just because they have the bodies there. Okay. Well, you know, for the most part, um, in terms of skill players, obviously T. Higgins is back. Wide receiver three is an interesting spot because you have Andre Ayosevas. Ayosevas? I think I'm saying his name Yoshivas, right. Yoshivas, I think, oh, is God. it? I'm not saying his name right at all. Okay, Yoshivas. Um, AA. NHPI team member, Andre Yoshavas. Jermaine Burton is in the mix. Uh, you bring in Mike Gesicki in free agency, who's you know, basically a wide receiver for them. Replacing Joe Mixon with Zach Mox and Chase, Zach Ma- Moss, pardon me, who was sick, I think, preseason week one, but it's fine. Uh, Chase Brown. So my question for you is this. How do you think this group compares to last season? The biggest difference for me is I'm not saying that Andre Yoshivas is a better player than Tyler, Bur- Tyler Boyd at this stage of his career, but I do think that they're more flexible because of what Yoshivas can potentially give them. Tyler Boyd was a 95% slot player at, at this stage. If he was on the outside, it, there was a deficiency in the Bengals offense. Yoshivas can play either one, and that means Chase can play either one. So there are moments over the last few years mm. where this offense has felt stale and a little bit static because of some of the things we talked about and the fact that the receivers had predefined roles. I think it's going to be a lot more dynamic because Yoshivas just has a different skill set. He's got long speed, their size. So I think you're going to see Jamar Chase moved around a lot more because they just have a different feel to that position group. I think that's another trend we're going to see a lot through the NFL is um... – teams taking their best receivers and putting them in the slot a little bit more no and just doubt. general, general movement. But that's, I, I think the ability to do that with Jamar Chase is huge for this offense. And I think will be huge for Jamar Chase putting up potentially a career year. There's no doubt. And I, I think that they were in a unique position because for the most part, a lot of these teams just haven't had barriers to doing that. Like the Packers were able to do that with Devontae Adams in, in 2021. It's like, who was going to stop him from playing in the slot? The Bengals just happened to be this team where they were an 11 personnel team. Those were their best 11 players. And one of those guys could only play in the slot. So there's just going to be a different feel. And I think they're conceiving of that third receiver role is kind of like an amalgamation of those three different guys. It's Yoshivas, it's Tanner Hudson to a certain extent, who I actually think is a really solid pass catching tight end, and Mike Gesicki. You know, some combination of those three, depending on roles, depending on matchups, and they'll kind of figure out that figure that out as they go. So, I guess my question for you is: If the twenty four Bengals offense struggles, why? Like, where are they the most fragile to you, other than the obvious, like if Joe Burrow gets hurt again or there's any lingering issues from the injury? Talent at the, at the interior spots. You know, Tech Harris has been solid but unspectacular. The left guard, I think, is still a big question. So the offensive line talent overall, I, th- I think, can yeah. limit exactly how far you can go. And I think the question becomes, like, how do you meld the worlds that we're talking about? And if you're going to be in the gun, like how do you create some of those explosives? The, some of the things that they told me and some of the things they're working through, they sound great in August. It's like, we're going to do all this stuff and we're going to you know, add all these play actions, et cetera. But it, it, you don't know until you actually get started how much that it's actually going to matter against NFL defenses. So not being able to find those explosives because the, mer- the worlds don't merge in the way that you want them to, plus just overall ceiling concerns when it comes to the talent on the, on, along the offensive line. I think that's fair. Um, I am optimistic about the offense. Very optimistic. Same. Less so about the defense. Uh, Let's get here. I think before you get to what the defense can do better, what they can fix, we have to talk about what went so horribly wrong for this unit last year. A lot of things went wrong. Um, They finished 19th in uh, DVOA versus the pass, 28th versus the run, so you should probably start there. Run defense. I I think, though, you know, the, well, one of the biggest challenges with sort of pinning blame on anyone with the run defense is just the struggles at all three levels. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and then when you look at this group and you try to think, okay, are they going to be better against the run this year? Did they find answers? Obviously the biggest change is starts on the back end, bringing in Von Bell and Geno Stone at safety, moving Dax Hill out to corner, who was by the way, fantastic in the preseason game. We can talk about that. Um, I'm not sure Robert and then DJ reader's gone. Sheldon Rankins is in. 
You draft some young players on the defensive line. I'm not sure I see a fix for that on this roster. Do you? No. And they, even their own, their defensive linemen that they brought in, they aren't big guys. And Sheldon Rankins is a penetrating three technique. Chris Jenkins is it doesn't have that sort of body type. So I think there are major concerns there. With the bodies they have, there are two solutions to, to solving run defense problems. One, you play like banshees. Like you play like the Niners, you play like the Jets, you play like the Texans. You're not worried about having 340-pound nose tackles because violence gets it done. That's not how this team plays. Or two, you solve it schematically. Run blitzes, stunting the front, yeah. et cetera. Like, I think that they're going to have to get very creative in some of the stuff that they do because if this front is static with the personnel that they have, they're going to get absolutely gashed. Speaking of the front, um, I was, when I was putting together, you know, I was trying to think about like, okay, like, again, thinking about changes. I was looking at the depth chart. Trey Hendrickson was amazing last year. Trey Hendrickson is 30. Sheldon Rankins is 30. BJ Hill and Sam Hubbard are 29 and 29. The two linebackers are, I think, both 28. That is an aging group. And my feeling is you really need some of these young players, both recent drafts and the one you just had, to take a leap forward. Do you feel like do any of them jump out to you as candidates for like making the leap guys? Maybe, but we didn't see anything from them last year that would lead you to believe that. Like, did you see anything from miles Murphy last year? We're like, Oh yeah, he's going to be an impact well, player in year two. No, I did not. And I was, I was watching him and he played a decent amount in this preseason game. And I still felt the same way, frankly, I know it's just, pre I'm not trying to like, you know, say preseason week one, but he was a guy where I watched, I was like, I'm going to watch this bagels defense doing the AFC North this week. And I want to see, I'm watching Miles Murphy. I'm watching Dax Hill position change. Dax Hill was awesome. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't feel great about it, to be honest. I mean, if, if Dax Hill goes in and plays one of those other corner spots, which I think he absolutely could, and I think he's in the mix, you're either replacing DJ Turner or Cam Taylor Britt. So somebody you spent a second round pick on in the last three years is going to get displaced. And that becomes part of the problem here is that when you build like the Bengals, and you build conservatively, you have left yourself such little margin for error. This plan of we're going to pay Joe Burrow, we know we're going to pay Jamar Chase, we're going to spend our money on offense after this kind of microwaved free agent defense ages out or becomes too expensive, we're going to need to supplement this group with young draft picks. That's how this is going to go. We're right. going to let Jesse Bates go. We're going to let Von Bell go. We're going to let Jadobi Awuzie go because we're going to draft guys to replace them. Well, if those guys don't come along, then that plan doesn't come together. We're going to talk about another team here that is able to kind of outrun some of their mistakes because they don't treat the salary cap like it's a real thing. Like if you spend money like the Browns, your mistakes matter less. If you spend money like the Bengals, your mistakes matter very much. And we have seen that, I think, over the last couple of years. The plan made sense. The plan has not come together. And now I'm a little bit worried about whether it can. Yeah, I think, right, That's it's you know, when they paid Joe Burrow... And whenever we would talk about NFL Live, we said, okay, now they have to, they literally have to replicate what the Chiefs did, they, you know, on yeah. terms of like building that defense through the draft. And it's a great comparison because the Chiefs spend cash in a similar way to the Bengals. They're not going to be overly aggressive. It's more traditional. You, you look at this group, you look at the last few drafts and you're not seeing the hits that they need. You know, like if Dax Hill is a good corner, and we'll see. Like I said, I thought he was really, really good in this preseason game. Um, and I and I liked him in college, too, by the way. He's a player that I was high on coming out of the draft. So their miss would be my miss. But um, otherwise, yeah, I, I, I'm just not so sure that, you know, and they've really focused on the trenches, obviously. And Mims looks fantastic. And that's, you know, great for the offensive line. But, like, the defense-wise, the defensive line, I, I just see – like you said, aging players without clear successors. Um, as far as this year, I think the question just kind of is, can they be average? Because if the offense is as good as I think we believe it can be, they don't have to be great defense for this team to be a contender. I do think we might, you know, it, it's so funny when you think back to that Super Bowl run and I feel like maybe it's getting farther away than uh, – like the reputation of the team versus that run, they're sort of that's right. The time is a little elapsed a little bit too much, but the defense was fantastic, and they weren't great during the regular season. People forget they were okay, but they weren't 
anywhere close to how they played towards you know the, in the playoffs and they, they were average in the regular season they were average which is part of the reason why we all like anointed Lou Anarumo as a god after that it was because the perception was he took an okay group of like you know some like you said some free agents and some decent players and he he put together these incredible game plans and he got play out of them that was like so far above their talent level I think betting on that to happen again with this defense and that's not you know about a referendum at Anarumo it's really hard to do in the NFL um especially by the way if Hendrickson who again I want to emphasize was fantastic last year takes any kind of step back all of those contributing pieces the most important players in the defense the ones that are still there they're three years older Von Bell is three years older. Mike Hilton is three years older. Trey Hendrickson is three years older. And if you're going to have that, I mean, it's inevitable. Your guys are going to age. You need to supplement that with difference-making pieces who are on rookie contracts, and they just haven't done that. When, when they had a bunch of Bs across the board, they could get by defensively. But now you have fewer Bs and more Cs and Ds. So that's the problem. If you're going to have weaknesses, like true weaknesses on defense, you have to have difference making players at some of those spots to make up for it. And that's just not how this group is constructed. And I think that both the floor and the ceiling are a little bit more worrisome than you want them to be. I think the optimistic case, just to kind of put a bow on it, would be that if this cornerback group turns out to be a strength, because... Mm -hmm. I like these players. And if Dax Hill, <laughs> I'm really leaning heavily on this preseason week one performance, <laughs> but dude, he was flying around out there. I, I even posted a clip. I was like, damn, like, uh, okay. But if I, I, I like Cam Taylor Britt, DJ Turner, I think has shown me enough to, for me to have some optimism. And if Dax Hill is good, you know, regardless of, and then of course you got Mike Hill in the slot, it, it, regardless of what the best one, two starting lineup here is if that becomes an area of strength for them and Geno Stone, I, I actually, I, I we kind of skipped over that. I, I really liked that signing. It was my favorite signing mm -hmm. as a free agency. I think he complements really well with Von Bell and with what Andrew Ruma wants to do on the back end. So if the secondary suddenly becomes, we, you, you talked about sort of, um, you know, it's like used to be B's and now it's C's. If the secondary becomes like a, a B plus, A minus, then you kind of ease up the pressure a little bit on the front. I'm still a little bit concerned about the run, but in terms of rushing the passer, I feel better about this group. Then you get towards average, which, as I said, is where you want to be for this defense. I think that's possible. I think the communication on the back end is the number one thing that is going to feel different than it did a year ago. So you have Von, I mean, Luana Rumo said this to me just flat out. He's like, no one is happier than me that Von Bell was back oh, here. God. Literally, I mean, he is so happy to have him back. And I think it's just because it allows the top down communication to be a part of this defense again, where last year you had Dax and Nick Scott on the back end with Jordan Battle. You had three guys who were essentially stepping into starting roles on this defense for the first time. And so that affected the play on the second level. And the, effect, the play on the second level is going to affect the play on the first level. So I just think that having Von Bell back there, even if he's a couple years older, even if the ceiling may be a little bit different, just as like a calming force yeah. and a linchpin of communication for a defense that relies on it. I mean, they do a lot of wonky stuff. You need yeah. somebody to be at the center of all of that. And I do think that having Von Bell back gives them a fighting chance to be that sort of defense again, where they're not hurting themselves. The level they gave up more explosive plays last year than any team in the league. Yep. If you're not going to have explosive talent, you can't give up explosive plays. And then, and, and you bring in Stone, who, you know, he. <laughs> It's a little bit like you picked off Joe Burrow. All right, you know, we're going to bring you in here. But he did, uh, obviously, I'm not saying like interceptions are necessarily sustainable, but he's a, he's a ball hawk. Uh, he flies around back there. Again, if this is a defense that needs to live a little bit on variance, I like that, right? If this is a defense since like going back to the playoff run where we saw, okay, like, yeah, they're not going to be like super fundamentally sound at all three levels and certainly not at a top 10 level in the league. However, if we can create a little bit of havoc, if we've got a rangy safety, we can play the post and close on the ball and maybe Von Bell's lost a step, but he's back there playing center fielder. I like that approach uh, that they took. I, I really liked them bringing him in. All right. Those are the Bengals. Let's take a quick break and talk about the Cleveland Browns to see if Brandon Ayuk has been traded. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. 
All right, we're back. The Cleveland Browns. Let's start with the defense here. Let's flip it. Mostly because <laughs> I want to like to I want to pick up the vibes a little bit. I feel like <laughs> I feel like going from you know just yeah. Uh, I'm okay. so optimistic about the Bengals' offense. That's what's so depressing about I know, this. That's that why I, I really yeah. do think they could be really good. I believe you, man. You sold me on it. I felt good about them after that. I felt good about them before, to be clear. Uh, the Browns defense. I think that staff is really underrated. That, that's one more. I, I want to say that. I think that staff is super underrated in Cincinnati. Yeah. Even after losing Brian Callahan, I, I think that they do such a good job of like, what are the right ideas? How does this apply to us? I, I just have a lot of confidence in their ability to figure out the right ways to use those guys. I period. think I saw Jake Browning joke about Brian Gall- Callahan getting a job because people thought he sucked. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the video audience, that was me slowly and uh, raising good, my good hand. Good for Jake Browning, like, man. Yo, one of the best backup quarterbacks in the NFL. So shout out. They also have that, which matters. We didn't even talk about with the Ravens. Uh, that's a situation. If uh, Lamar goes down, uh, it's Josh Johnson. Seeing Tyler Huntley in a Browns uniform this weekend was jarring. I, the fact that Josh Johnson is the backup quarterback for the Ravens is deeply depressing and, and a little bit worrisome. Like if you yeah. think you're going to win, yeah, if you want to win a Super Bowl and that's your situation, yeah. how, on a scale of one to 10, how surprised are you that Jake Browning had a functional stretch as an NFL quarterback after watching him at Washington? How, how surprised am I or him? Because yeah. he wasn't surprised at all. You. <laughs> oh, I, was, I got dragged for, I made a joke about Jake Browning punting. I was like, he can punt. And I got dragged when he thrived. I was super surprised and I own it. He was great. He was, I was so impressed by him. And that's important. So there you go. There's your Brian Callahan head coach case right there. Right. But uh, uh, both Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson, backup quarterbacks do matter a lot. And we didn't even acknowledge that. I don't think I've acknowledged on a single single division preview. And that's stupid because uh, both of those guys have missed a fair amount of football games. So that could be the difference. The Bengals, we could see Jake Browning versus Josh Johnson more, you know, it's, entirely possible for the division please don't, please don't do that it's august 13th. Uh, can we please we can not think see, about jake browning versus josh well, johnson yet we, we actually are going to talk about backup quarterback with this team but we're not going to talk about them right now we're going to talk about defense uh let's talk about the defense the defense is awesome the defense is stacked uh the defense brought everybody back so there's really not that much change to discuss the biggest difference i mean there's there's just some depth issues there's or not issues depth changes but for the most part, this Browns defense is is running it back. Um, they were incredible last year. They were incredible in just about every metric possible, except for weirdly red zone. So if you want to argue for them being better than last year, they randomly had like the worst red zone defense. Maybe not randomly because uh, you can point to some issues, but that like the fact that they were as good as they were and horrible in the red zone, not that teams have reached the red zone very much, is pretty freaking impressive, Robert. They gave up 71% a touchdown. They gave a 71% touchdown rate last year. It was number one in the league by like, I can't even tell yeah, you how much. So last- can I, can I, I-, I just want to take a minute. So the Browns defense was first in like everything, right? Being first in everything when you give up that many touchdowns is absolutely insane because advanced metrics give more weight to obviously touchdowns. So the fact that they still finished as high as they did in all of these advanced metrics just shows you how unbelievably the dominant they were outside of the 20 yard line. And also nobody was getting to the red zone. I mean, that was the problem with this team is that they were giving up some explosive touchdowns because the way that they play, but that their success rate was like historic. And if you look at what they did on a play to play basis, they dismantled most of the offenses that they played against. It was wild. So that's a C game is burned into my brain. Like watching what they did to last yeah, year's Titans and just like punting them up in the air was, it was crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the Bengals cream. Oh, geez. Speaking of the Bengals. Um, I know I said, well, okay, no, no, I'm going to put this part of the conversation off for a second. Cause I do want us to still live in the positive stuff. So let's start with how could they be even better potentially this year? Well, not giving up 70% touchdown rate is a start. Um, a couple of things that just jump out to me, uh, Grant Delpit, who got hurt at the end, I think is not just like a really, really good football player, but a really, really good football player for Jim Schwartz defense. And I think getting him back healthy, but then the fact that they saw that they had some depth behind him, you have a little bit more flexibility now on the back end yeah. because you have so many good players. 
I think that's right. And Ronnie Hickman, who played for them last year, went forced into action. You know, they they, see, they saw a step forward from him this offseason. So the fact that now he's your third safety, you know you're going to get eight to ten solid snaps from Rodney McLeod at this stage of his career, which is an absolute miracle. Good for Rodney McLeod. It, it, yeah, he is, he is still on this team, and he, he is like a contributor for this team in certain packages. That's real. <laughs> I totally thought he retired. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I can't. So, they feel good about that group. And I think that Delpit is such a great example of a guy who was unlocked by playing this way. Yeah. Just somebody who where it all came together. And so they have depth at all the important areas. And obviously what happened with Mike Hall today is, is something to, to pay attention to. I mean, he just got arrested for a domestic violence situation. So their depth of the defensive line is going to be a question. But even without him in the mix, they still have a lot of people that they can throw at that. I, I think the reason that I would be optimistic about them potentially being even better is last year was about establishing a play style. It was about saying, we're going to play with a certain attitude and a certain mindset. And they benefited from it as much as a defense can benefit from it. Now, I think it's about adding layers that make you a little bit less susceptible when teams try to do specific things to you. A little bit more disguise, a little yeah. bit more diversity. That's what year two of a defense like this hopefully will look like. And I do think that they're very conscious of that. So you kind of got to what I was sort of hinting at. But I think it is actually, the way you're framing it correctly is... Um, the optimistic angle on this, which is what the hell went wrong in the playoffs. <laughs> and, uh, but I actually think that it's, it's um, when we talk about like, how can this Browns defense be even better? I, I think that game, there's a couple others during the season. Rams. The Rams. Game, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Where, where you saw this defense has such a very clear. And what does McVay always talk about? Regulated identity. Yes. Right, which is they are going to come out, they're going to play single high, they're going to play man coverage, they're going to press their corners, they're going to send a four man rush, and guess what? They're going to dominate you because they have unbelievably talented pass rush and corners who can press. And nine times out of ten, the NFL, you're effed. The Niners were effed going up against it, by the way. However, what you also saw in a couple games, unfortunately, in the worst possible game, the worst possible moment in the playoffs against Houston. Um, that can leave you vulnerable to misdirection at times, uh, to overaggression. I think the playoff game, though, you know, going back, thinking about it, it, it was a little bit of that and some problems carrying over from the regular season. I also think the defense was pressing, which you don't usually think about defenses pressing, but they saw Flacco melting down a bit, and it almost was like, okay, we got to make a play, guys. Like, we're going to have to win this one for the Gipper, and they did not. They did the opposite of that. They were <laughs> extremely busted, but... Um, there was a little bit of a mental, like a psychological aspect to that too, at least that's how I read it. But to your point, like, I think those are things that they can improve upon this year. Um, and, and some of that will be through, this was year one, we established his identity. Now let's build some layers to this so that we can actually dictate to defenses, not just through talent, but also through scheme. And have them not just dictate to us. And I think that's the biggest problem. And you think about the way that the Rams handled them, and that's exactly how McVay puts it. It's, are you a regulated defense? Right. It doesn't matter how much talent you have. If you give a regulated defense to Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford, they're going to fillet you. Like That's going to be how it goes. And that's the concern I have, is that when you play against these teams with really good quarterbacks and really good play callers deep into the season, the teams you have to beat in the playoffs, what does it look like if you're going to be that regulated? The stat that I used on our show is against 21 personnel on early downs last year. They faced 83 snaps of it. They had a heavy box, eight guys in the box on 45 of those snaps. That was the highest rate in the NFL. Think about what the Texans do. The Texans yeah, want to be in 21 personnel because yeah. they want you to throw all those bodies in there because they want you in single high so they can sling it all over the yard. You have to get to a place where the really good play callers in the league don't know every single button to press to put you in disadvantageous spots. And I think that becomes the biggest challenge for them heading into this year. It was such a stark contrast seeing the Texans against the Ravens defense. Limits, exactly. Right. And the Ravens yeah. are on the far other end of the spectrum. Literally, yeah. I mean, this was, it was such an, a cool year for the NFL that the two best defenses were in the same divisions and played like goofus and get like, just like totally yeah. different brands of football. <laughs> Um, both played with like speed and physicality and they were so well coached and, and tackled and all of that. But yeah, you, what you saw on display back to back weeks was like, oh, you have to have this in your tool bag to go up against offenses like this. And I think they can, no doubt, um, in part because uh, I think Jeremiah Husakomura is an absolute star, dude. And I think to do what we're describing, they need him to take like one more leap forward. I think he's already like the he just 
flies around and he's I, I think he's a really smart player, but he has to sort of be the quarterback, I think, of that evolution in a way. And well, you know, just quarterback on the field. And I think he's capable of it because I I I just he's one of my like ten maybe favorite players to watch in the NFL right now. He's such a perfect expression of how they want to play. I don't know how good he would be or how valuable he would be in a different defensive system with a different defensive identity, but for them, he's absolutely perfect. And I think you could say that about a lot of the guys on their defense. I, I just want it to be a little bit harder. I want it to be a little bit harder for opposing offenses yeah. to figure out exactly what you want to do. I mean, you, the Ravens, I believe, finished second in the NFL last year in the number of snaps they started the play with a too high safety shell. The Cleveland Browns were dead last. And I'm not asking you to change everything about who you are. I'm just asking every once in a while, can you line up one way and play something else? It doesn't have to be all the time. And they do have weird, funky cover two variations that they use and stuff like that. But just a few more complimentary things in order to allow you to play the way you want to play while also not leaving yourself vulnerable. That's it. All right. I think we're both very optimistic about the Browns offense, defense, pardon me, unsurprisingly. The Browns offense, on the other hand, is a uh, a bit more perplexing or not perplexing uh mysterious shall we say uh so uh let, there is some change here they are not employing brandon Ayuk. he i guess he rejected the i don't know they they wanted brandon Ayuk, which i thought was by the way kind of fascinating that they were reportedly willing to part with cooper in that just kind of thinking about i don't know whatever point is it's not we don't Andrew even Perry is at a point now where if there is an elite player available, he's, he's going to pick up the phone. Yeah. It, that, that's just how it's going to go. I mean, he's yeah. just one of those GMs, and, and I think that we should probably just get used to that. So uh, there's two discussions to be had here. There's whether or not either of us believe Deshaun Watson is capable of playing good football. There's that discussion, and then there's the how do you call the best possible offense for John Watson in 2024 with their new offense coordinator, Ken Dorsey. Uh, these two questions are kind of hard to disentangle because whether he's capable of playing good football and what that looks like obviously has a lot to do with what this offense looks like. I thought last year I had a feel for maybe what would be the best offense to call for Deshaun. And now, Robert, I am not so sure. Um, we saw the Kevin Stefanski offense at its apex with Joe Flacco. <laughs> uh, you know, the obviously heavy emphasis on the boot game, the under center play action. He's calling RPOs with Flacco. I'll never forget that. Uh, my question for you is, before we get to what we actually think of Watson, do you think that that's, we're going to see something similar with Watson? Do you think it's going to evolve? Do you think they're going to build on what they did last year? And do you think Dorsey is going to have a stronger hand in steering this thing? I do. I think that that's probably why they brought him in. I know that's why they brought him in is that they wanted some new ideas in new places. And if you look at what Ken Dorsey was doing in Buffalo, obviously it's much more spread out and the personnel groupings are a lot different than we'd seen from the Browns over the last couple of years. And the, the two things I would say with Dorsey that have been the biggest emphasis since he got there and kind of the things we're trying to incorporate diversity in the dropback game, right? Like Kevin Stefanski, the play action game, the screens, the run game, all things that he thrives on. It's very, very strong in those areas. Drop back game diversity, I don't think is one of those things. And I think that's why they sought out Dorsey because they thought he would be able to give that to them. You know, they were sniffing around Kellen Moore too. Th that, those kind of people that you know, Dorsey, that offense in Buffalo it comes from New England, right? I mean, that's the DNA of it. Yeah. So you get to a place where it's a little bit more traditional drop back. I think that's one. Two is RPOs. They used a ton of RPOs in Buffalo with Josh Allen. And I think that we're going to see more of them. They wanted to do a decent amount of it with Deshaun Watson heading into last year. I don't think they ever figured out the right ratio for it. And again, you had a staff that was moonlighting in it. That's not where Stefanski comes from. Really the only person on that staff who had robust experience with RPOs was Bill Musgrave, who was kind of a senior assistant for them that had worked with Chip Kelly. And now they bring in Ken Dorsey. He is very fluent in that world from his time in Buffalo. And their assistant offensive line coach, whose name I can never remember, came over from Philadelphia. And obviously the Eagles lived in the RPO world over the last couple of years. Tommy Reese, their tight ends coach from some college. He's not as much of an RPO evangelist as somebody like Dorsey is, but he does understand the background of it. So as they kind of got all into the same room this year and were like, okay, what does this look like? You had a lot more voices as part of that process 
that understood the RPO world and understood how to best incorporate it into this offense and into what Deshaun Watson could potentially do well. Maybe I, I should have started with the Watson question first then, because I think um, you just said what Deshaun Watson does well. I guess that's where we have to start here. Like, what do you think he does well in 2024? What do they think he does well in 2024? So when they got him, I think that part of the plan was we're going to be a team who loves to live in empty. Because if you look at what he did in Houston, that was some of the best stuff that he did. And so that was originally going to be a huge crux of the plan. Unfortunately, we've gotten to a place where defenses have gotten really strong in how they're going to handle empty. And they're just zeroing it now. If you're an empty, there's so many teams, especially against Cleveland, that's what they're clicking into. So that isn't necessarily the lever that they thought they'd be able to pull. So if we can't live like that, how are we going to spread things out for him in a way that allows him to thrive but doesn't put us in bad situations? And so I think the answer to that becomes a lot of 11 personnel, potentially a lot of 10 personnel, and we're just spreading things out and having the quick game replace some of the first and 10 running game along with the RPOs. So this is a far cry from what we have come to understand as a Kevin Stefanski offense. And that's part of my concern here is that even if you think it's not, you've that your best 11 include your receivers now. Like that, that is just the fact with the Cleveland Browns. And so that is fine. If that's, those are your best 11 players, you want to drift to that. That's fine. But now essentially overly catering to the quarterback and what he does and losing the strengths of your identity as part of that process. I have my concerns about it. I get why they're doing it. I have my concerns about how it actually unfolds. So I went back and rewatched Baltimore, because that's the game that gets brought up all the time. It's the glimpse of Deshaun Watson being back week 10 before he got hurt. And uh, because, you know, they came back, they won. He was very efficient in the second half. And I think, like, what I was trying to imagine is, like, okay, this offense map. I wasn't trying to say, is he elite now? He's not. I'm sorry. Like, that game, he's fine. He's fine in it. And it's not nearly as impressive as everyone who holds it up wants it to be. Well, it's certainly not who what we saw in you know the early part of his career. Um, I mean, I wrote down the bet. The, it's weird because the, the his the second half is where it was good. The best ball he threw was in the first quarter. It was a oppo. It was a oppo hash out to Elijah Moore, I think. Uh, but that was it for deep balls. In the second half, really, what I thought was. Um, best was his scrambles, actually. Um, it was. Yeah, I and, agree with that. So, oh my God, David Joku had a catch and a run in that game. <laughs> Holy Do you remember the one I'm talking about? It's yes. He dragged like half of the Ravens. David, okay, brief positivity pause for Browns fans if you're listening to this and you're clenching your fists. I would go to war for David Joku. He is such a sick football player. He is amazing. Okay. And, That's and, what I'm saying. Like the receivers in the best case scenario here. Yeah, they right. Can get Cooper, out of Judy with Cooper. Perpetually underweighted. That's why when I mentioned that you trade, I was like, that's interesting because I think Amari Cooper is awesome. I think he's so underrated. Uh, and then Judy, Elijah, Joku. It's a great group. Okay. Anyways, back to Deshaun. Uh, so when I when I watched that game, though, and I was thinking like, what does this look like in 20 to 24 to build a functional offense out of this I think it really sounds like a lot of what you're describing based on that game, which is the ball's got to come out pretty quick. You're not, it's, it's, it's not an explosive passing game. I'm sorry. Unless maybe he shocks me and maybe he, the deep ball looks better this year. I'm just going off of what we saw last year, you know, and then he, another year lost to injury. Um, and then you want to see him that mobility. Uh, and I think that mobility, Robert is going to be key to whether or not, this looks any good, whether the offense is efficient, whether or not they can move the ball. Um, Because if not in the world that you're describing, the margins are so slim for that thing to work. But if he brings back some of that scrambling ability, uh, then I think, okay, you you could see coupled with an elite defense. And, you know, if he protects the football, checks down to his feet every now and then the offense could be efficient enough for this team to win games. I think that's right. I just think that you have to add value with your legs if you're going to have deficiencies as a passer the way that he does. And the way that we, we talked about it on our show today, it's such a unique situation with the way that they handle things over there because we look at it as he's making $63 million a year and they traded away three first round picks to get him. This is a disaster if he's not an elite quarterback. Well, that's true and it's not true. 
because the cap doesn't apply to them in the way that it applies to some other teams, they've been able to outrun some of these problems. They're going to convert his salary to zero every single year and just keep pushing money more and more into the future. So that has allowed them to sign all the players they want, make all the trades that they want. So the answer eventually becomes, he doesn't have to be an elite quarterback. He has to be an average quarterback for us to be successful because we can sustain some of this stuff. The problem is he's not an average quarterback. If he was the 15th best quarterback in the league, this wouldn't be an issue. He has not played like that. He's played like the 27th best quarterback in the league. And I don't know if that changes. And, and that's why I'm concerned with the overall build and the overall plan, because I think he still has to clear a certain bar for any of this to work. And I don't know if he can. It's, it's also going to be disastrous in the future. I, I just want to like, you know, maybe that's not disastrous right now. It's going to be disastrous. Um, there's just, yeah, there's no way to spin the trade as being anything other than even if, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Like it, it works because what is that uh, curse where like, you gave up one thing and you get everything else. I'm struggling. I'm not reaching for it, but whatever that curse is, Andrew Barry like a monkey's has paw it. sort of situation. Yeah, look, where every other decision he's made has been good. Every other signing has worked out. Every player he's identified. We'll see what he gets out of Jerry Judy. That's going to be really interesting to me. But like, uh, everything else has worked out. It, it's a it's a fascinating test, except for the most important position in football. The things that he looks for and the ways that he tries to find value with players, I think, have led to some real hits. And I think yeah. that for the most we've part, them. we've been ripping them off. Like they're they've so steered them in the right direction. On this team. I mean, I yeah. do think there are blind spots too, though. Like the Judy thing is that you make the Judy trade skeptical. because it, it's. I get it, right? He's twenty five. If you look at his the, the percentage of the cap that he's getting paid, it's like 26th among receivers. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes I think that's the way that and Andrew Barry and some of these Eagle guys think. It's just like, well, this is a tarnished asset. Like to think of it like a hedge fund manager where it's like I can get this at a price that I shouldn't be able to get this for, so I should buy it. But it's like, okay, well, how does it fit in all the other things that you're doing? Like, that's my only concern. I feel the same way about Saquon in Philly. It's like, oh yeah, we it's with the, we bought the dip, and that that so we got him at a price we shouldn't have been able to get him. It's like, was that the most important thing? I'm not sure DeAndre Swift is what was holding you back last year. I guess if I should say though, if the offense is kind of what you describe it described it to be, and I think sort of what you see the value of like an an intermediate supposed elite route runner like Jimmy GP. Okay. I just I think they see him as like a vertical slot player. And if the goal is to be a more like quick game based offense where you're spreading things out, like Jerry Judy's not like a choice runner. So I, it, I didn't, again, I just, I don't Yeah. And, and Elijah Moore, I think they conceive as an outside receiver. The way what? that they used them last year. Yeah. It, I think when they're in 11 personnel, you have Cooper on one side, you have Elijah Moore as the outside receiver, and you have Jerry Judy as like a Christian Kirk esque vertical slot player. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know how that works. You know who uh, will get you the ball downfield? Joe Flacco. <laughs> the other guy they brought in. Let's see. What's your over-under on Jameis Winston starting a game for the Browns? I, I think you have to put it at like four and a half at least, yeah, right, yeah. considering how the last couple of years have gone. And part, of, honestly, part of me is fine with that. I, I had so much better of a time watching the Browns with Joe Flacco last year. I think uh, everyone in the Browns – had a good time too. Too good of a time. Uh, they're going to be a really, really hard game team to project for me because I think this defense will be a lead again, which is really, by the way, like you always want to have caveat when you're projecting a defense to be a lead because it's so hard to replicate year to year. But I look at the step chart and the coaching staff. I think the world, of, I, I just, I, it, it's hard for me to imagine a world outside of Miles Garrett, knock on wood, getting hurt where this defense because of its depth and talent isn't as good as they were last year. So the offense being a mystery box makes it makes this team very, I, I'm going to have so much trouble picking every Browns game this year because of it. Like week one, they got the Cowboys, you know, it's just no. like, it's a nightmare. Okay. Finally, mystery boxes, the Steelers, nothing's happened. If it has, I haven't, no one's alerted me. <laughs> um, so part of the reason I, I want was not a but it was because of the quarterback competition is ongoing we got a look at justin fields well russell wilson has been injured he did not play in the preseason he's been out i guess he's back now we did get a look at justin fields robert you're a bears fan 
Did you feel like you were just watching the Chicago Bears again with uh, with your boy out there? It, it's so hard for me because I do think that I'm I'm I am more interested in watching the Pittsburgh Steelers if Justin Fields. Same. Like full like full stop. Clearly. And he I a lot I'm of the downsides there. with Fields I think apply to Russell Wilson. Like yeah. Fields is going to eat a lot of sex. So is Russell Wilson. Right. If you look at it, their EPA for dropback last year when Russell Wilson was playing with Sean Payton in a hyper conservative offense was the same. Russell Wilson and, and Justin Fields. So if the downsides are at least in the same ballpark, I would like to explore the upside. And then Justin Fields goes and puts the ball on the ground twice in a preseason game. And it's the one thing you can't do if Mike Tomlin is your coach. So it felt like Russell getting hurt fumbled the job away to an extent. And then I think Justin might have just fumbled it right back after the way that he played last weekend. So, God. The way he played, it was, it, it was just, it felt like the field's experience, right? There were some good balls thrown downfield, the deep out to, was it to? It wasn't to Pickens. Yeah, it was to. Someone else, I can't remember. Uh, oh, I can't Jefferson. name another receiver Van on the Van Jefferson team, so. is on the Steelers. Yeah, every time I see him, I'm like, what? Um, it was Van Jefferson. Van Jefferson uh, is the number two receiver on the Steelers, unchallenged so, currently. Roman Wilson, who was a draft pick I really liked out of Michigan because I, I think he's a really good fit for the Arthur Smith offense, has been injured. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, And then you saw the, the fumbles, the snaps, holding on to the football. I will say, um, we talked about a little bit on NFL Live. I thought Orlowski – did a really nice job explaining to us like some of the, 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 the certainly the fumbles it's always quarterback center. And I think the center who was in, uh, it wasn't, it was Herbig. So it wasn't yeah. Zach Frazier who they drafted or Ma Mason Cole. So we'll see. If Herbig Frazier is starting right now. And, so and I think <laughs> they're bringing Frazier along a little bit slower. Well, <laughs> you buddy, I actually, I don't even know what the, we'll get to the offensive line. Cause they, 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 there were some combinations there that I was like, wait, what Dan Moore jr. Still left tackle and Roderick Jones is right tackle and whatever. I don't know what exactly we'll talk about that in a second, but some of it wasn't his fault. Uh, there were some issues with the routes um, where like the, on the, um, the uh, Daniel Hunter sack where he blew past um, Fautanu some of that was on the receivers. So I don't think it was entirely on fields, but it doesn't appear to me that he is, at least based on that, uh, that, that outing, that he's like improved in the ways that you would think he needs to improve to certainly build upon what he did in Chicago in terms of playing faster, vision over the middle of the field, vision generally, that kind of thing. However, it, it's there's that, there's the, are you comparing Justin, like you, you hit on this, we're not comparing Justin Fields to Justin Fields and saying he needs to be better. We're comparing him to Russell Wilson. And I think that's where this gets tricky because to me, Justin Fields doesn't need to be better than he was in Chicago to be a better fit or more exciting or give this offense more upside than Russell Wilson at this point in his career, especially because, you know, you're talking about preseason. There's not that designed quarterback run game. This offense is with Justin Fields doesn't go without a heavy designed quarterback run game. And, I think you and I, I don't know, actually, we haven't talked about this, both think, I think, that this could be a really, really good rushing attack. It was a really good rushing attack at the end of last season, and they've continued to invest in it. If you throw Justin Fields into that mix, it should be one of the better run games in football. So I guess, Robert, like as a Steelers fan, like, how good does Fields have to be as a passer to justify going with him over Wilson because of what he brings to you with his legs? It's a, it, as a passer, I think is the wrong way to frame it. What is the value you're getting from the dropbacks? And the reason that I put it that way is how much is he adding as a scrambler? If you're able to create some explosives consistently and he's solving problems with his legs, that's just an area where it, it, it closes the gap. Like even if it's a little bit more volatile and a little bit more unstable, I think that it, you at least have to explore it because of the dimension it potentially gives your offense, because you're just not getting any of that with Russell Wilson at this stage of his career. So what are you getting with Russell Wilson? Because the, the rust we saw last year was better than the rust in 2022 who was God awful. But frankly, it was a combination of being a check down merchant and an occasional beautiful deep ball thrower. That's it. He didn't throw to the intermediate part of the field. He certainly didn't throw to the middle of the field. Uh, so I guess my concern is that Tomlin and that staff who, you know, tend to be a little bit conservative might lean on him, not just because of his 
veteranness and bona fides, but because they're just like, ah, we can, he'll protect the football and we can count on him. I, that is what I worry about when I think about this quarterback competition. But that's totally justifiable because that's exactly what I'm worried about. And I think that's probably how they're thinking about it. And I think it's going to lead to just a really unsatisfying answer when we get to week one and we figure out who the Steelers quarterback is going to be. The reality is we're probably going to see both of them. So we can talk about this quarterback competition and I don't know how it's going to play out and like the order in which these guys play, but they're probably both going to play. Um, gosh, this has been such a bummer. Okay. Wait, like let's, I, I want to like bring up the happiness here. I do see a world. I talked about the run game in which Arthur Smith, this particular group of skilled players, this offensive line, you can maybe explain to me what you think the configuration is going to be because I'm remain a little bit confused on that front, frankly, and I'm tr- I've been trying to like parse it out. There is a world, I think, in which we see sort of like a, um, a plus version of what he did in 2022 in Mari- with Mariota. What was that? What year was that? 21. Oh, 21. Tw- no, yeah, 22. 22. Is that yeah. a is that the wrong way to think about it in your mind, or does that feel right? I honestly think that it's going to be some combination of what we saw with Mariota, but also what we saw in the end in Tennessee, where he's just funneling the ball to his best players. And I think that overall, the construction of it, that's what I would expect, where if Pickens is just your best receiver by far, are you just feeding him the ball whenever you're throwing it? And, and I think that Arthur Smith is, you know, when you – when, it, when you have an experience the way that he did in Atlanta, you learn lessons. And, and I think that you have some real hard conversations with yourself. And I think that part of the what he potentially learned from that experience is let's just keep it a little bit simpler. Like, I don't have to worry about trying to get this guy's touches, trying to get this guy's touches. With this skill position group, you can literally just throw the ball to George Pickens 30% of the time when you throw the ball and no one is going to be upset with you because of the rest of the configuration of your skill guys and your receivers. So I think that, it has a chance to be the the way they funnel the passing game in the run game. I think that when we get to the season from left to right, it will be Broderick Jones, Isaac Salamalu, probably her big in week one. If I had to guess with Frazier potentially getting in there a little bit later, James Daniels at right guard and uh, Broderick Jones at right. T- or excuse me, Troy, Font- Troy Fontano at right tackle. I think that is very likely the group that we will end up seeing. Yeah, I feel good. I very likely might be strong. I feel good that that's a group we'll end up seeing in week one. And I do think that that group has a chance to be a very strong run blocking unit if things come together. And I think that we have seen Arthur Smith devise really good run games in the yeah. NFL and diverse run games. You know, in Atlanta, they were built for outside zone and they did outside zone. But in Tennessee, they ran a bunch more stuff than that. And I'm this group has that. the body types to yeah, it's, it's be more diverse than they were. Yeah, I know. I, I've heard folks mention that they, they were more of an outside zone offense in Atlanta, but um, I think like that's a little bit of a short memory. And I also think Arthur Smith is, um, they, they were an outside zone offense because they were an outside zone offensive line. Like That's how right. that, that team was yeah. built. That's not how this offensive line is built. And like you said, this, this should be a really good run blocking offensive line with guys who can pull. I really like the interior. Um, this is quietly become like one of the better guard duos. You know, I, I just, um, I love some hollow. I, I think that yeah, guy can really smaller. play. And if we get yeah. to a point in the season where he's like their third best offensive lineman, th- that's when you can really start cooking. And if Roger okay. Jones takes a step and Fatano is good, like that's on the table. This can be a real strength for them, which it has not been in a long time. You got Darnell Washington who's basically a six offensive lineman out there. <laughs> You just seen how big he's gotten. I oh stood next God. to him on the, on the sideline. I was standing right next to him on, on our show today. Derek Classen was like, "Yeah, he weighs like two eighty. And I was like, "He wishes he weighs two eighty. Yeah, <laughs> that guy is three hundred <laughs> if he's anything. And for what they ask of him, that's completely fine. He's a big dude. Um, yeah, I. Uh, there's a vision for this team being, I just think with fields like very annoying to game plan for, but um. I just think, yeah, Fields got to clean up some stuff. I don't know. I just, just give me the upside, please. I'd rather see it. I'd rather see it. I I don't want to see that version of the offense I was talking about earlier. Um, Where are you at with the Raiders? Would you rather see O'Connell or Minshew? That's really the only one that's still up in the air. Where do you sign that? Yeah, earlier in the week. Um, I would rather see O'Connell, but I don't feel great about it. And I was saying it's the worst – Gardner Minshew is the worst possible quarterback to bring in for a quarterback competition because you're going to get like three amazing quarters and he's going to win it. And then he's going to be 
like it's just the streak will end and then you're going to go back to O'Connell and you're going to wonder what it was all for. I, that's how that was playing out in my mind. It's incredible to me that a team that did what they did with Jimmy Garoppolo last year would be like, you know what we want to do? We want to spend more than bridge quarterback money on another stopgap option. We'll just see how it goes. So upsetting. Um, okay. The deal defense is wrap here. Um, so this is an interesting group. I have, I, I had them in my top 10 and they haven't Me been too. in everyone's top 10. Okay. So the case for them being in the top 10 is there's, there's young talent on this roster. Is this what you were talking about when we were talking about, um, the Bengals? And I think you mentioned like there's a t- team that oh, no, I was talking about the how the Browns can outrun their problems because the way they spend money. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So I think that the Steelers, I look at this depth chart and you certainly see age, obviously Cam Hayward's getting up in the years, TJ Watt, but then you see youth and promise. Keanu Benton, they bring in Patrick Queen, um, you know, the guys they drafted last year. I mean, Nick Her- uh, Nate Herbig, Nick- God, both Herbigs on this team, it's really annoying. Nick Herbig is the pass rusher, right? Nate Herbig is the I, I have, yeah. I truly have no idea. Upsetting. Um, Joy Porter Jr. looked awesome for them. Uh, freaking Peyton Wilson, God, in the preseason game, balled out. So uh, I think that th- this is, you, you feel a lot better about sort of the short and long-term sort of um, uh, potential of this defense. The case for them being elite, I think, is just kind of based on this pass rush continuing to be absolutely dominant, and then the improvements that whether or not even uh, Wilson plays, you bring in Pat- Patrick Queen, this is going to be a better linebacking group. I think if you're going to cast doubt on them, it really starts on the back end, particularly the cornerback group. Um, as part of the Dante Johnson trade, Dante Jackson came back at corner to play opposite Joey Porter Jr. Nickel seems like a little bit of a question mark for, for me. So I get it. I think that's reasonable. However, I think highly enough of Porter Jr. in year two and the front seven for me not to be like horribly worried about that, even if it takes them a second to maybe figure out their exact best configuration in the back end. It's really interesting counterbalance to the way that we talked about the Bengals, where if you're going to have a lot of Bs, you can't have weak points, right? Yeah. You need elite players to offset question marks. Guess what? <laughs> Steelers got a bunch of elite players. When you have TJ Watson, A plus. Alex Highsmith is an A minus. Cam Hayward is an A. Minka is an A. So you can live with some C's. And I think that's why I'm confident about where they could potentially take this group. This is a top 10 unit last year. And like, even if you've got questions about Dante Jackson, Patrick Peterson was getting a ton of snaps for this team last season. Minka didn't play for a huge chunk of last year, and they still were like the sixth best defense in the league. I just have so much faith in inertia, the what, who's in charge of that unit. And I really do think that their front has a chance to just be hellacious. If Keanu Benton can take a step forward, Highsmith is such a good player. I and mean, Hayward, even at this that. stage of his career, like that group, even if there are depth concerns potentially in the interior specifically, I think that they have a chance to dictate games. And if with Porter and Minka, it's like, all right, we'll figure out the other spots. And the linebacking play, even if you have concerns about Patrick Queen, they had NPCs at linebacker by the end of last year. Like this is a significant upgrade. So I, I don't know. I, I get why people are a little bit worried. They're the oldest defense in the league last year, all that stuff. I, I just think they'll be pretty good. If there is like one player who this all hinges on, like, the, and I think when I say hinges, you and I both agree, we're talking about like them being a top 10 defense hinges, not because you know, with the Bengals, we were talking about, like, what does it take to get them to average? I think that's the goal with the expectations for the offense. With the Steelers and the very different expectations for that offense, you need this defense to be top 10 again for this team to be a contender. And you need the offense to be average, right? It's kind of the flip. Who is the one player who, when you look at this defense, you say, for this team to finish in the top 10 again, obviously Watts staying healthy, all that, you know, whatever. But if, if there's one guy you'd have to put this on, who would it be? It's a great question. Part of me says the linebackers, like it, it, Landon Roberts is such a thumper and Queen has never been very good in coverage. So if you get to a place where both of those guys are minuses in coverage, is that going to leave you a little bit too vulnerable? But it's hard to say, like, I think you could say Deshaun Elliott is in there as somebody who's going to have to start for them. I think you say you could say Dante Jackson, like any of those 
not stars playing at just a passable level, if you can get it from 75% of them, then I think you have to feel pretty good about this. The question is whether or not you do. Yeah, I, I think for me, if Minka returns to like Minka form, Fitzpatrick, then I have no, even if there's some question marks, linebacker, corner, I have no doubt this is a top 10 defense. If that dude plays like one of the five best safeties in the NFL, it's fine because he, when he's at his best, he is such a fireman. Like he puts it, he just compensates for so many issues you potentially have on the back end. And when you think about some of the potential high flying offenses you're going against in the AFC in your own division, um, then he has his ability to affect games is really important. But if I'm a Steelers fan, um, yeah, I, I'd be really excited what you saw for Joey Porter Jr. year one. You want to see maybe a little bit more consistency in coverage, a little bit less handsy in year two. He's always going to be a little handsy. It's just part of his game. But um, some of that maybe cleaned up a little bit. And then, yeah, like guys like Benton, who, you know, just I think he's a lot of people's favorite kind of making the leap guys for a reason. If he takes the expected leap as well. He just looks clean, different. He just moves different. Like you watch him play and just, I want to yeah. see more of him. I, I can't remember what the exact numbers were, but Larry Ogunjobi outsnapped him on third down, like two to one last year. I, I, no, yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah. I'm done with that. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's wrap here. How do you see this division shaking out? One, two, three, four. I think Ravens. Still, I'm still picking the Ravens. I, I just think the floor on defense is really high, and I think the offense has a chance to be be elite again. Like if if you buy into the year two step forward that they can take, I, I still feel the best about them. I'm probably going, I'm probably going with Cincinnati after that. Like the the offense, this is a question of like, do I bet on the the Cincinnati offense or the Browns defense? And I just think that I feel better about betting on the Cincinnati offense if Joe Burrow stays healthy. I think that's kind of where I fall on it, and then I probably go. The Browns after that and the Steelers after that, just because of concerns about whatever the Russell Wilson, Justin Fields combination looks like. <sighs> Top 10 defense. And we've got them fourth in division. That speaks to how unbelievably strong the AFC North is. Uh, <laughs> I think all of these teams are playoff contenders. Uh, and I have the same ranking, by the way, just to, I, you know, I was holding my breath there before you said Bengals too, but I've got Bengals too as well. What, what, um, put, what puts the Bengals over the Browns for you? Like what's ultimately a determining factor? I... I would say it's even, I know I went on this whole spiel about how defense is great, how defense is hard to replicate, but uh, I think that the Browns can do it. I do think that, however, if the offense looks worse than they did in the second part of last season with Joe Flacco, that's tough organizationally to deal with. I, 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 I just, there's going to be some difficult, conversations in that building and I, I know I, I I I'm not saying like oh the defense isn't going to play as hard because they're saddled with like a worse offense but I do think just going back to that point about great defense being hard to replicate year to year a couple injuries at key positions there would you know could potentially even if that defense drops down to you know like 10th or something there could be some issues there. Whereas on the flip side, I, I just have so much confidence in the Bengals offense, maybe not at the beginning of the season, but at some point hitting that sort of pace that we've expected from them with Joe Burrow when he's healthy. So I agree with it. that. I mean, it, even if the, the Browns defense regresses, there's a chance they still finish number one. Like yeah. that, that's how good they were last year. They can regress and still be the best defense in the league, but you're right. I mean, defense is so predicated on effort that if you have an offense that's just consistently torpedoing itself over and over and over again, can you maintain it? Like we've seen teams do that. The, the Patriots did that last year. The Jets did that last year. It's not impossible, but it's certainly more difficult. Yeah. Well, we shall see. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Could be over optimistic about the Ravens. Uh, Russell Wilson could prove me wrong as well. We, we don't know. Well, uh, there's still more to be playing out with that quarterback competition. So I'll be hitting that not on this division preview. Obviously, uh, we only have one more division preview, but in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Uh, Robert Mays, thank you so much for joining. For those who don't already subscribe, the Athletic Football Show is now joined by a guy who's been on this podcast a lot, Derek Klassen, who's absolutely wonderful. So if you don't subscribe already, uh, give 
that a subscription. Uh, you guys are, you're just starting your division previews right now, right? Yeah, so. AFC North was first. And so we'll do a couple of them a week here over the next month or so. I just got done with my training camp travels for the most part. So we were holding off for a little bit, but we're letting it ride now. Well, if you think this podcast is too Geno positive, don't check out that podcast because they love them too. <laughs> Uh, you can always uh, listen to this wherever you get your pods. You can check it out on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Mina Kimes, where uh, you can also check out that Cam Jordan interview that I just teased. It was a ton of fun sitting down and chopping it up with him. We're also on ESPN2 on Wednesdays, I think. Yes, Wednesdays. So uh, you can check it out there. Thank you, as always, to everyone at Omaha Productions for working at the show. Kirsten Sebecki, Anthony Jimenez, Owen Saylor, Jack Foster, Kevin Matice, and Tucker Tashton. Otherwise... Back next week. Whoa!